Good evening, everyone. We are very happy to um, host Melinda Myers again for another wonderful gardening workshop this evening. We're going to give everyone uh, just a moment here to join the presentation, and then we'll get started. So thanks for joining us tonight. Seeing a lot of uh, folks joining in the program here. We'll get started shortly. Just giving everyone a chance to join in here. Good evening, everyone. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight. We are going to talk about container gardening throughout the year, and we are very excited to welcome back uh, friend of the library and gardening expert, Melinda Myers. Uh, my name is Kelly Bolter. I'm the adult programming coordinator for Milwaukee Public Library, um, and it's been our pleasure to host a series of really insightful and wonderful webinars with Melinda this spring. Um, we uh, record them and post them on our YouTube channel so you'll be able to see this presentation and we've got a few more that are coming up this year as well so you can watch those on demand at the Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, just some housekeeping for tonight. Um, you have access to the chat. You'll see that on the bottom of your screen there's a chat icon there so feel free to chat with um, everyone who is in the presentation this evening. Melinda will have time at the end of the program to answer your questions. So if you've got questions, um, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It's right next to that chat button. So when you enter your questions in there, we'll make sure to answer them following the presentation. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'm very excited to hand it over to Melinda for the presentation. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Kelly. And Kelly sent out the handout, a link to the handout about an hour and a half ago or so. So you might wanna check that out as well. I listed all the plants in the different container combinations or most of the ones that were pretty key. So I know that everybody's like, oh, what's that plant and how do those go together? So um, you may wanna take a look at that as I covered. If not, you can look at it that later or maybe when you review the recording. I always like to thank those folks sponsoring the events. Uh, we Energy is the sponsor of this webinar, but also the library program that we're doing in conjunction with not only Milwaukee Public Library that's hosting this event, but public libraries throughout Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And if you're not from either one of those places, we're happy to have you join us. There are activities as well as the webinars and videos to help support your gardening efforts this spring. As I mentioned, thanks to the public libraries um, for being part of this program. And I know some of you may be viewing it at a viewing party. We've heard from several libraries. And if you let us know in the chat, we'd love to know if you're a librarian and you're hosting a viewing party tonight, we'd love to hear from you as well. So let's get started. I'm going to take you throughout the whole year, starting with spring. We've had some crazy weather across the country, 70 degrees in February, 13 degrees not too long after that. It's been kind of a crazy spring. But when we're looking at spring plants, we're looking at those typically that take the cooler temperatures. If we have any friends down south, these are also your winter annuals. So what you're seeing here in the right-hand side, the purple and orange are nemesias. Those are very cool weather plants, great for pollinators. I was out in my garden today taking some photos, a lot of bee activity, um, even saw a couple of butterflies. So they're out and looking for sources of food. The yellow is osteospermum, sometimes called African daisy. There are several plants that go by that name. That's another plant that really thrives in cooler temperatures, so excellent for spring and fall containers. Forcing branches is another great way to get some vertical accent. You know, pansies are pretty tiny in the spring. So adding that vertical accent, whether it's pussy willows or forsythia, like you see here on your handout, there's a link that talks about forcing them. So maybe you're doing a little pruning on some of your spring flowering shrubs or trees. Take those branches, put them in cool water, like 60 degrees in a brightly lit cool location. 
and missed it whenever you have time and the ability. And in a couple of weeks, those buds should start to swell if they're not already, and you'll get flowers. What a great way to add to a bouquet, or in this case, to a planter with pansies on the left and needlepoint ivy. On the right, the pink is stocks, terrible name, but a very fragrant plant, excellent pollinator plant, great fragrance, cool temperature plant. What I find with my stocks, I often put them in a pot by themselves or with pansies. When the weather gets warm, I kind of set them aside out of sight, continue to water them, then bring them back out in fall when the temperatures get cooler. Um, you probably see lots of containers with spring flowering bulbs. Now, if you're in the north, it's often too cold for us to plant those bulbs directly in the container. So we're gonna have to force them. If you're in the south, it may be the case that it's so mild that your bulbs don't get the cold treatment they need. Spring flowering bulbs like, um, like hyacinths, grape hyacinths like you see here, daffodils, tulips, need a chill to initiate flowering. So maybe you buy them, pre-cooled, you can order pre-cooled bulbs. Maybe you buy a pot of bulbs from a garden center and set that in your container, or you do the forcing yourself. So if you have an unheated garage and you're in the north, a styrofoam, maybe a styrofoam cooler, pot up your bulbs. The styrofoam cooler, if you're in a really cold area, kind of gives it the insulation it needs. So it gets the chill it needs, but not so cold it kills the bulbs. On the right, I just buried that pot in a vacant part of my garden. So it got the chill that it needed. One gardener told me he had a, one of those prefab um, ponds and he'd empty it in the fall. He'd set his pots of hyacinths in there, fill it with straw, put a board over top, and he gave me a pot of hyacinths he forced. It was perfect. So he'd just take them out when he needed them, put them in a, either out on the patio deck or if he got them out early, he'd bring them indoors and enjoy those forest bulbs. I have a spare refrigerator for seeds, as you can see, for forcing bulbs, a few insect samples and such. So that allows me the opportunity to do it in a spare refrigerator. Don't store your uh, your apples and pears in there because they give off ethylene and that can interfere with flowering. You can also put your tulips in a perforated plastic bag in the fridge, takes up a lot less room. Give them a chill, then plant them directly in your container in the spring. I'll often pack them in peat moss just to keep them from drying out. This is Oldbrook Botanic Garden in Madison a few years ago. So here you could get a pot of spring flowering bulbs, set it in the container, then plant some greens like the ornamental mustard you see here. There's some uh, lettuce as well. So edible and ornamental. Pansies are edible as well. I always um, look for those that are fragrant. So when I'm picking my pansy, I got my nose in those six packs, but just remove the reproductive parts and you can eat your pansies as well. You may want to do trees or shrubs in pots. Now, you want to make sure that that container will tolerate the weather wherever you're gardening. So for those of us in up north, we don't use terracotta and glazed pots if we're leaving them out all winter long. Instead, cement, wood. Um, I've had good luck with plastic. It lasts a few years, and by the time it kind of starts to break down, it's time to put um, move the plant into a bigger pot anyway. The grow bags, as I mentioned earlier, fiberglass. So look for those things that will tolerate the weather. But great vertical accent, an excellent option if you don't have a lot of in-ground planting space. Um, just a couple example, a riot of color. I don't know about you, but boy, when spring finally does arrive, I can't wait. The bulbs are my first bit of glimpse of color, but boy, a couple of pots on the left, that blue flower with the white um, edge around the purple uh, center, that's a Sonetti um, persica. Uh, for callus. And it's another cool weather plant. I'm seeing a lot of the Sonetis being sold and out on the market, both in the spring and in the fall. So you get that daisy-like look, a wonderful plant. Again, they mixed it with some Nemesia and some petunias. On the right, look at that riot of from gold to orange to red. Again, the orange is uh, some African daisy, osteospermum, and that's mixed with Nemesia as well. Pansies are a favorite. They're everywhere usually and easy to find. The pink flowers that are a little more upright are Sweet William, a type of Dianthus. And don't forget about Alyssum. It's a nice fragrant flower that will bloom for you all summer, but really does great in the cooler temperatures. And Dusty Miller, 
good hardy plant. These are flowers that will take cool soils, cool air. And I've seen pansies covered with ice. I did a book um, signing in Michigan once and we had an ice storm, went to the garden center in the morning. The pansies were all covered in ice. By the end, by noon, all the ice had melted. The pansies looked just as good as they started with. And then really maximize that impact by putting several containers together so that you can really um, give some big impact, whether it's your front steps. This is Pasquazy Home and Gardens in Lake Bluff, Illinois. And so really to make that statement at the entrance. And I love the fact they elevated one of the pots to give some vertical interest. This is my patio um, in the summer, and I do a lot of pots. I have 11 acres that I can, well, not all 11 are available. Some are in the woods, but I have a large property, but I love containers. I like to test new plants. That's my living room you're looking into. And so I like to have plants that when I'm looking out my living room, I've got that garden right outside. And I've got plants that bring in the pollinators so I can see hummingbirds and butterflies visiting the plants. A few edibles, you can see a tomato in the right and a, 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 a pepper as well. That pink is a cool plant called Soiree Flamenco, like the dancer annual vinca. And I'm going to be talking more about these this spring. And if you join me at State Fair Park, I'll have some pots to share as well to show and tell. Just a very different look of a heat and drought tolerant annual vinca, catharanthus. But again, it allows me to grow a garden in a variety of pots right outside my back door. House plants have been making the move outside. Some of you may have been doing this for years. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, if these are plants that live indoors in the winter, move out for the summer, you need to gradually introduce them to the outdoor condition. And I have a link to a tip on that as well. The idea is think about if you go on vacation down south and you're a northerner and you've been inside all winter and then you go outside and lay on the beach, you just fry. The same can happen to our plants. So if they've been inside, when we move them outdoors, maybe an hour of direct sun, maybe two hours the next day. Or I like to put mine in dappled shade whenever possible because it makes the transition easier. So we're gonna gradually get them used to going outside. The downside is when you bring them back in, you'd have to reverse the process, but you might have some insects tagging along. Uh, this is a planter outside of a uh, restaurant, but what I love about it, if you've grown asparagus fern, that's trailing down in the front, easy to overwinter indoors, and it's very vigorous. Ball horticulture is introducing some new, more compact varieties, but here they've mixed it with a rubber plant in the upper left corner of that planter, a coleus. The upright plant is false aurelia, got nice texture on that, and of course, like a neon dracaena on the right. And I know I'm going fast over these plants because I have too many to share. But again, on your handout, you'll be able to follow them and maybe go through the recording later. Um, Sansa, well, it used to be Sansevieria. They've renamed uh, the botanical name for snake plant is now a Dracaena, hard to believe, unless you look at the flowers. But I love that strong vertical accent. This is on a deck in Minnesota. And she kind of defined the area, not only with that string of lights, but with these this collection of house plants. And again, it's under um, uh, uh, a patio, a deck with a roof, so it's filtered sunlight, perfect for those plants. Ruby, uh, rubber plant. Now, rubber plants um, related to ficus benjaminum, weak being fig, this is another ficus or in the fig group. Changes in the environment can cause leaf drop, but they will recover. Um, and I'm seeing more and more of these available at a reasonable price. And so look at that beautiful color. This is just a pot of ruby rubber plant. So again, you, it'll take full sun. I've seen it growing in full sun more in the north. If you're from the south, it might be a little too hot afternoon shade. But again, putting it in some dappled shade, dappled light, that makes that transition easier and the colors will just shine. Um, the plant with the really spiky things are sometimes called rat tail. A terrible name. It's a peperomia. It's watermelon peperomia. And you can see why they call it that because the leaves are striped like a watermelon plant and a prayer plant that folds up at night. So it might add a little entertainment, a little fun if it's sitting in an area where you can watch those leaves fold up as the light gets lower in the evening. 
Now here we've got fuchsia, an upright fuchsia, either thalia, T-H-A-L-I-A, or garden meister. And it's combined with some variegated dracaenas. And then the blue is lobelia cascading over the edge. So really people are looking at house plants, tropical plants now as part of our container gardens. Maybe you wanna go edible. And here's an herb garden in an old fountain that's been converted to a planter. So space is limited. Going vertical is one option to do. And you also have that vertical interest and it makes harvesting easier as well. For a little fun, um, planting up a colander. Here I was growing parsley, curled parsley. Um, I've done greens in the colander. I've seen succulents in the colander as well. Um, I just line mine with um, some weed barrier or landscape fabric to hold the soil so it doesn't fall out the little the holes. But how about this for a centerpiece when you're on your buffet or on your table where guests can clip off the herbs they need to season their dishes? If space truly is limited, maybe you have a deck with a railing, use one of the railing planters. This is a self-watering pot. And so you can see a collection of herbs here from sage, which is the green and cream. We've got golden thyme in the center, which contrasts nicely with the purple ruffle basil. There's some parsley in here, some green thyme and some rosemary. A couple of ways, there's always room, not always, but many options for adding edible plants, especially with containers. So on the left, this gardener used cocoa mat lined planters that I think blend nicely with their wooden fence, mounted it so they had space for more growing space available to grow some of their favorite vegetables and herbs. On the right, I was lucky enough to speak at Epcot a few years ago and boy, they, their horticulture is very creative. So here is a stacked type of container and she had all kinds of things growing. Some tomatoes you can see, some cherry tomatoes, some greens, even a pineapple on top. Um, I sometimes struggle with cocoa mat liners. So I know some people will put disposable diapers inside to help absorb the moisture, line them with plastic garbage bags and punch holes in a regular hanging box basket or a container, I'll pot things up in a plastic pot and set it inside. There were some liners called aqua liners. I had trouble. I was trying to find them before this talk and couldn't find them online, but they had some plastic built in. So they really worked well for those of us that struggle to properly water those containers with cocoa mat liners. Imperial star um, artichoke is the vertical accent on the left. You can grow them even if you're in the north. It's a plant. You need to start the plants indoors or I just buy my transplants um, from Ebert's Greenhouse Village. They know I'm always there stocking up. I have harvested chokes. Now, it's not as great a harvest as if I was living in California, but living in the north and being a gardener, if I can brag, it's all worth it. But doing it in a container, if the season, if we're running out, you know, if there's a danger of frost in the fall, you can bring that pot inside, put it back out when the weather is warm. But even without the choke, it's a nice ornamental plant. I might have misidentified the trailer um, at a quick look. It kind of reminded me of verbena, but looking closer, it's scavola or fan flowers, the purple cascading and the white is diamond frost euphorbia. On the right, just a collection of kale, all subtle, but look at the beautiful blue green. Lacinata kale is the vertical accent there, combines nicely with flowers. This is Chicago Botanic Garden located in Glencoe, north of the city. And um, they have a fruit and vegetable island. So if you have a chance to get there, you'll get lots of great ideas for containers and then also in-ground plantings that are edible and ornamental. The leafy plants in the background are, a, are asters. And so can you imagine when they form their bluish purple flowers in a, another couple of weeks, you can see the buds starting to form. They'll really carry that red from that red cabbage, the purpley red leaves of the cabbage, and just tie that whole thing together and add a really nice element. And dichondra um, cascading over the edge. I call this my portable potluck. 
um, dish. Um, I love to grow greens in a container, some pansies and chives. You know, if you grow chives, you could always find seedlings in the garden to add to any pot for vertical interest. I take this one, I'm invited to a potluck so people can harvest greens for their sandwich, add some pansies to their salad if they're daring, and then maybe cut up some chives for their potato. End of the party, I take it home, grow it on until the next event. So it's kind of a fun way to have a great conversation and get bring the garden right to the event. Maybe you're looking for an elevated uh, garden, whether you have a patio deck or just to make harvesting easier. This is a Demeter planter. A couple things I like, it's nice and deep, so it holds more soil, so it doesn't dry out as quickly as some. It has wheels, so I can lift one end with the handle you can't see and roll it around where I need it. So the plant in the middle is nasturtium, Alaska nasturtium, which the leaves and flowers are edible. The yellow flower behind it is calendula called pot marigold because the petals were used to season soups and stews and they're made in pots. And some people thought they look like marigolds. So pot marigold or calendula. Again, this is a plant that likes it cool. It will reseed. So I've even had pots where I brought something indoors for winter, say a rosemary, and I had calendula growing with it and the seed survived. When I put it out, they grew or they'll drop into a surrounding garden bed. Um, flat leaf parsley. Um, most of my friends that are much better cooks than I prefer the flat leaf parsley, great texture. Marigolds are edible, though you have to get past the smell, though there are some like the Signet series that can be a lemon or orange, a little more uh, flavorful and fragrant. The vertical accent here is Brussels sprouts and Brussels sprouts are a long season plant. And so that vertical accent will be there all season long. You can watch it grow. You can watch the little sprouts develop and then harvest even after a light frost in the fall. If shade is an issue, um, this is Dawn who works with me. This was her combination. So she had garden meister fuchsia, that's the upright fuchsia, some Swiss chard, bright life Swiss chard. And then the cascading fuchsia is called Santa Claus. What a perfect name. A couple reasons I wanted to share this. One, it works well in shade. So if shade's an issue, you've got an option. But two, the fuchsia is part of a combination. We often think of fuchsias as a basket of, of fuchsia, a hanging basket of fuchsia, but use them as trailers or vertical accents mixed with other plants. Um, on the left, I basil, the red and purple type basils like red ruban, purple ruffle, ruffles, they tend to be more resistant to downy mildew and they add some nice color. And yes, I needed to do some harvesting, but my line is the pollinators are enjoying those flowers. I used a determinant tomato, one that grows a certain height and stop. I think this was a bush, uh, better, a bush boy tomato, and then some more nasturtium. On the right, this is an indeterminate tomato. And one of the things, they don't sell this container anymore, but there are more and more pots available with built-in trellises. And I find that makes it so much easier to grow indeterminate tomatoes. Those are tomatoes that grow flower and fruit, grow flower and fruit, until if you're in the north, the frost kills them or you pinch out the growing tip if you're somewhere else. And that gives those plants, the flowers time to form fruit and the fruit a chance to mature. Here we've used strawberries, um, day neutral strawberries or ever bearing strawberries that produce several crops of strawberries in a season as our trailer mixed with golden money wart. Red boar kale, what a vertical accent. I used these in a, in a trellis planter. That was a big mistake. It didn't work well. This is what I should have done. This is not my pot. But isn't that a cool vertical accent? Very unique, very different. And it's edible, ornamental. And it's one of the ornamental kales that is got has good flavor. With it, you can see the curly rush and some calabricoa, yellow calabricoa some impatience and Dusty Miller. I'm often asked about grow pots and that's what you see on the left. This was a rooftop garden in Quebec and they grew lots of vegetables um, in this rooftop garden, including these pole beans. Now I've had great success using grow pots. I've planted sage and it survived the winter, even in my when I was in the city, a zone five garden. Um, 
rhubarb if you want to do perennials or I've grown horseradish because horseradish is aggressive. So putting it in a grow pot is a way to contain it. And that container will last over the winter. If you're in the cold area, you want to insulate those roots. So I would put bag leaves or if I had straw bales for fall decoration, I just put those around my containers or my annual pots around my perennial pots for added insulation. And I do have some links to overwintering containers um, in colder regions. On the right, I wanted to show you the Sun Dipper tomato, an indeterminate tomato new from Burpee, great, or from Ball Horticulture, sorry. Great flavor. I think I bought my seeds from uh, tomato, uh, totally tomatoes. Um, so you might need, you'll need to start them. I got to start my seeds here real quick. The plant that looks like a canna is actually turmeric. Um, it's an 18 month crop. So being in the north, I start it in the spring. I either buy plants or start the root plant it, grow it outside for the summer, bring it in for the winter, often dies back, but then re-sprouts in the spring. I made my first harvest last February, I think, or maybe it was December, January. Not a lot, but just enough of those rhizomes to have a little fresh turmeric, and it was fun to grow. The kufia is a great pollinator plant. We'll talk more about that later. Um, just another option, no space, put your garden in raised beds right along the walk. A citrus, this was taken in Oklahoma. So those pots are perfect. The plants could stay outside. If you're in the north, you're gonna want containers that you can lift and move indoors. There's a link on the handout to a blog I wrote from Melorganite on growing citrus indoors and out. So those of you lucky enough to have a warm climate, you can grow your citrus and leave them out in the winter as long as it's a frost-free area. Those of us in colder climates need to bring them inside, sunny window, maybe add some artificial light. Um, but Meyer lemon um, is probably in the Mexican lime, some good, easy ones to grow. And more and more garden centers I see are selling those around the country. But maybe you want something good and hardy, um, but you want something compact. Bushel and Berry is a company that's introduced quite a few compact varieties. They used to be called Brazelton Berry. Now they're Bushel and Berry. This is Baby Cake's Blackberry. You could get up to two crops a year on this plant. The flowers are pretty. The fruit is edible. You just need to protect it from the birds. And um, again, we'll talk winter protection in a minute, but it's about three feet tall, three to four feet tall and wide and thornless. That's a real plus if you've grown blackberries. You only need one to get fruit. Um, blueberries like moist, well-drained acidic soil, and many of us don't have that. And so they've introduced a lot of compact blueberries. So you could grow them in a pot where you're using potting mix that tends to be acidic, moist, and well-drained. Now they've introduced two two varieties that work well in hanging baskets, safflower cascade and midnight cascade. So how fun is that? Blueberries have beautiful flowers, edible fruit, great fall color. You only need one, but if you do two blueberries nearby, you'll get more than double the production. And again, the birds love these as much as we do. So you may need to protect the fruit. And you can always grow apples in containers. Now you're gonna to wanna to use a weatherproof pot if you're leaving it outside all winter. Uh, this was down in Missouri, uh, but there are some nice columnar varieties available. Most apples, you'll need two different varieties for pollination and fruit formation. And so a couple of the upright columnar types are listed in your handout. North Pole, two to three feet wide, eight to 10 feet tall. Golden and Scarlet Centennial, about the same size. The urban apples, they have four different varieties, are about that, are even narrower, about two feet wide, eight feet tall, and start producing in just a couple of years. So a great option that you could use several in pots and create a screen or as a focal point like they did here. 
all of us are concerned about pollinators. And even if you're only gardening in containers, you can bring pollinators to your landscape, to your patio, to your deck. When I lived in the city, I'd always have pollinator friendly plants on my balcony. And I was always amazed at the number of butterflies I would get. I use lots of planters near my house, as I mentioned, so I can see the hummingbirds visiting. On the left is a kufia. I think it's vermilionaire. Um, non-stop flowers all summer. Uh, you don't need to deadhead. The hummingbirds love the kufia, C-U-P-H-E-A. The licorice vine cascading over the edge is a host plant for painted lady uh, butter for the caterpillars of painted lady butterfly. Um, some more kufia on the right. I'm not sure what the variety is here. And they've used zinnias. Now zinnias are great butterfly bee friendly plants. The single ones are even better because there's more nectar. Hopefully you spotted that hummingbird, black and blue salvia. I'll tell you, I always include pots of it in my on my patio and deck and my raised planter because the hummingbirds love it. Um, Wendy's Wish, Hot Lips, all of these salvias. Salvias are great hummingbird plants. And if you're in zone seven, this one will overwinter for you in the garden. On the right, lantana, smelly leaves. I love when they say it's fragrant. It smells. Um, but it's an excellent butterfly, hummingbird, and bee plant. Those of you in the South, if anyone's joining us from Texas area, I think parts of Georgia, Alabama, it, some of them can be invasive. So look for sterile varieties, even though you're growing them in a pot. The other benefit of the sterile varieties is they don't produce fruit, and so they tend to flower more readily. I find every once in a while I need to remove some of those little berries that start to form minimally to keep that blooming all season long, heat and drought tolerant. Maybe you don't have the time, the space, or the energy to do a water garden. I love what this gardener did. They sunk some pots that did not have drainage holes into this area of their yard, potted up some papyrus and elephant ears in pots using a water garden mix, put some stones on top to keep it in place, and then just kept those pots that didn't have drainage holes filled with water, minimize the watering need, and just kind of a really funky kind of look to that space. Maybe something more traditional, a terracotta pot or glazed pot with no drainage holes. I always say pick a pot with drainage holes unless you're doing a water garden. And then you could grow a miniature water lily, some acorus. There's bloody dock there, which I found the raccoons loved when I was growing it in the city, and some thalia, which looks a little bit like a canna. On the right, elephant ears. Wonderful in soil, but also can grow as a water plant. This was at Burner Botanical Gardens, the gardens at Whitnall Park. And a couple of things I liked about this, if you're a busy gardener and watering is a challenge with containers, right? Pot up your papyrus, pot up your cannas, pot up your elephant ears, put them in a larger container that lacks drainage holes and then keep them filled with water. That way you can be gone for the weekend. And if you have a plant sitter, they don't have to work as hard. And look at how pretty those are with very minimal care. And even a small water feature on a tabletop can really add a nice element. And here we've got some glass orbs to decorate things. Succulents are still very popular. If you live in a mild climate, having huge succulents is an option. For those of us in the north, finding a place to overwinter succulents this size is pretty challenging unless you have a greenhouse or a lot of big windows or space indoors. This is Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. But I like to share this picture because notice they use blue pots that are very eye-catching, but they complement that kind of blue-green green of the succulents. So they don't overpower them. They get your attention, but they really bring your focus to the succulents and the succulents still are outstanding. But maybe you want a little more color. And there are lots of succulents with great form, with subtle colors, or as you see here, some with colorful edges or include some moss roses that you see on the edge that are very drought tolerant and work well when combined with other cacti and succulents.
On the left, my friend Jerry likes to stack the pots. And I mentioned being in the north, it's hard to have huge succulents unless you either break the bank buying big plants from the garden center or you have a greenhouse or a room in your home to overwinter. But he stacks the pots, plants them like one container. So these smaller succulents really are providing some vertical interest and grab your attention. Or the gardener on the right just potted up a trough and put it on an old chair to elevate it closer to eye level. This is my friend Will's garden, and he took two containers to create this, tipped one on its side, had it spilling into the trough to really create a little bit bigger visual impact. And then repurposed items I'll talk about at the end. And uh, succulents in general have a shallow root system, a small root system compared to the top growth. So shallow containers work very well, like you see here. And then they decorated with some gravel, with some orbs, just trying to add some elements to complement the succulents, the hens and chicks that are growing there. If you visited me at We Energy Energy Park during State Fair, you've seen our green roof bird feeder, and some people do green roof bird houses. The idea here is we've just got a shallow planter, we fill it with succulents, and to much to my surprise, we leave this out all winter long and they survive. Every few years we have to replenish a few that have kind of faded out, but with that shallow bit of soil, elevated above the ground, I'm amazed that they do so well. Um, in harsher climates, you might want to bring it indoors into an unheated garage or a little more sheltered location. But um, just a fun way to add a little bit of greenery above the heads of your birds as they feed. There's a link to the crevice garden information at Allen Centennial in Madison, Wisconsin. I first saw the crevice garden there and it was just basically stone standing on end to create little crevices where they planted plants. And I have an area, I wanna try it, but it's a big project. And so I think maybe I'll take my lead from Wisconsin State Fair Park and make a crevice garden in a pot. Here she's got purple ajuga, which complements, it really stands out against that limestone piece of that flagstone broken in pieces, but just to create a little mini crevice garden. Fairy gardens, some of you may have thought they were done. I did, but they've kind of come back into popularity when you look at Pinterest and some of the things happening. My friend Chris on the right put hers in a galvanized tub and then elevated it so you could really see what's happening in that fairy garden. On the right, this was at a garden center in northern um, Wisconsin that I spoke at years ago. And what I liked is they had these broken pots. And instead of throwing them away, they set a pot inside so they could create levels for their fairy garden by using broken pots and assembling and creating different elevation in that container. And then just another example of how you can pull it all together. And here's the no maintenance garden. You know, rocks, it doesn't take much to keep them. My friend Will um, had collection of stone. My grandkids are always picking up rocks and I'm thinking, well, maybe this is the garden they start with. One of the things containers do for you is they allow you to have a lot of diversity. So you look, you've got succulents in their own pot. You've got some annuals that are gonna need more frequent watering. You've got evergreens that are gonna need some winter care, but you can have them in their container. So you manage the soil and your watering so that you can grow a variety of plants uh, with different needs, as long as they get the sunlight they need. And you could have kind of that type of diversity. I'm not going to talk a lot about container care, but I always like to say with containers, having those that have drainage holes is always a good idea because even if you could water perfectly, Mother Nature will dump some water. And we've had some really torrential downfall, um, downpours across the country. So drainage holes allows that excess water to flow away or a self-watering pot. But make sure your planting complements your container and vice versa. So I wanted to show head containers are kind of, are still very popular. So we have a variegated tradescantia on the right. On the left, fountain grass, oxalis. And then Dale Sievert, well known for his moss gardens, how appropriate his head garden has a 
crop of moss growing out on top. So matching the container to the plants you select, you know, the container in this case is part of the focal point, but you want the plant to fit nicely. Maybe it's just a terracotta pot like that on the left, one that's elevated, dragon wing begonia. If you haven't grown those, the whopper, the dragon wing, the big reds, very easy, sun or shade, bloom all summer, hummingbirds love them, and licorice vine, again, a good host plant. On the right, this is angel wing senecio, a type of a senecio, that dusty miller type plant. And that silver pubescence on those green leaves kind of echoes that silver of this galvanized bucket. So a subtle but nice complementary combination. A few vertical interests. Spikes were the traditional favorite, right? You either love or hate them. I meet gardeners that keep them for year after year after year, and others who are like anything but a spike. But they do provide good vertical accent, as you can see here. On the left with zinnias, the trailing plant is variegated plectranthus, a relative of Swedish ivy. We've got spike on the right again. Excuse me, with Angelonia, I may have also, called, hopefully, I identified that as Angelonia and Mizu, M E Z O O, which is a good drought tolerant plant. And the white airy plant is Diamond Frost Euphorbia. Here we've got Purple Formia, sometimes called New Zealand flax. Very strong. Some people overwinter these as house plants. Some people have success overwintering them like similar to their cannas, watering say once a month, leave them in their pot. Um, and then here they've got diamond frost euphorbia, that green and white, and then silver falls dichondra spilling out over the edge. So maybe you garden with somebody who loves spike and you don't. How about cordyline? Maybe that's, you know, a, a good compromise. Sold as Thai plant. Um, wonderful color. There's a lot of variety of cordylines out on the market. And here the trailing plant is terenia or wishbone flower. Cannas make great options even when they're not flowering. They provide good vertical accent with their foliage and croton, C-R-O-T-O-N, popular houseplant. I'm seeing more and more grown in containers outside. Fireworks fountain grass. So we see a lot of purple fountain grass and green fountain grass. Fireworks, the name is so appropriate because it does look like fireworks here with straw flowers. Gara, G-A-U-R-A, -A, Gara, um, an annual where I live. It's supposedly hardy to zone five-ish, maybe, um, but in a pot, um, it, it provides a great vertical accent. Here with verbena, and on the right is a dwarf cleome, like Rosalita. Um, there's a, several different varieties. Um, they do have a musky smell in the evening, but what a nice texture, upright plant. They can reseed readily, so just watch the area around the pot for any stray seedlings. White gara on the left with coleus and petunia, and then another cleome on the right with uh, calibricoa. Uh, Penicetum. Um, this is bunny tails. There's also red bunny tails. And so nice airy upright. Um, the, the seed heads really add some interest. Rudbeckia, annual form of Rudbeckia, um, that big bright yellow uh, daisy-like flower. Another example of a snake plant, and here's the new name, Dracaena trifasciata. Um, though you'll still see it listed as Sansevieria. Old habits are hard to break. Sago palm, cycad, this is one I've had good success overwintering indoors in a bright sunny location. Here they've let impatience cascade over the edge. One year our botanic garden put a really cool pot with a sago palm and impatience set it in amongst um, impatience in a shady garden bed, it looked great. Um, here, this is pots elevated at different heights and a, just a great diversity. You can see Virginia creeper at the base, the sago palm at the top. You can see some cordylines in here and some sweet potato vine. And more and more house plants are available and very affordable. Windmill palm with some portulaca, that's the yellow and silver falls dichondra and that silver echoing off the palm leaf. 
Um, Brugmansia, you can overwinter those indoors in cold climate in a sunny window, a cool place. They often lose most of their leaves, but can make it through. Um, this is a weatherproof pot. This is in Minnesota. So obviously they're not leaving this outside and expecting the Brugmansia to live. But when you're looking at overwintering plants outside, as I mentioned before, wood, cement, fiberglass, things that are weatherproof if you live in the cold north. Um, here they've put their Brugmansia and sweet potato vine in a pot and set it in the decorative pot. What's nice about this is you can lift that nursery pot out it's a lot less, it's a lot lighter to bring it and move it indoors. Maybe your vertical accent, especially early in the season, right? You put those little tiny annuals and they're like lost in the pot for a few weeks before they really gain, maybe even three weeks before they get some height. Maybe you do some painted dowel rods like they did. This was the Chicago flower show. On the right, bamboo um, stakes along with some fountain grass provided nice vertical accent and sweet potato vine trailing down the front. Morning Glories, this is my friend Jerry, who does great containers. So he had the obelisk, so that provided vertical accent till those Morning Glories could climb up and cover them and then begin to bloom. If you have, it's kind of hard to find, um, Solar Tower Sweet Potato Vine, introduced a few years ago. And I think one of the problems was people didn't realize this was a climbing sweet potato vine. And look at that. So you could have your sweet potato vine climbing up an obelisk or strings or a pole. And here they use sweet potato vine trailing down as well and eucalyptus, eucalyptus as a focal point. Here they train the Solar Tower Sweet Potato up another uh, sweet potato down, and a Senecio um, providing a nice contract with the silver foliage. The Rex begonia vine, you may have grown as an indoor plant. I think this was at Innes Woods in Columbus, just outside of Columbus, Ohio. But isn't that beautiful if you've got a partially shaded area? Um, just a very different look and feel. Mexican flame vine. Not knock your, knock your socks off, but if you're looking for unique plants, very different. Daisy-like flowers in orange. It echoes the shape of the rudbeckias in the pot. So just something different. So if you're looking to change out your vertical accent, vines can provide that. I honestly am not sure what this vine is on the left. Um, you could use a mandavia, the one with the bigger leaves. Um, here we've got a flower tower um, diaceus is the upright pink, which is very different, very floriferous and a more heat tolerant. On the right, they use twigs and coleus as their vertical accent. Here we've got coleus elevated. It's in a pot set higher than the other surrounding containers and begonias on the right and an autumn fuchsia on the lower level of that display. Here was just an, a paved area. Without that, be kind of, eh, what's the point? But here they used a nice planter with banana plant and some ferns. On the right, this gardener had pots of banana plants and that provided vertical accent within this garden bed. Uh, ferns and sweet potato vine, isn't that very, just the colors are wonderful. This is in a shady location, provided a nice vertical accent and nice calm colors that really go well with the surrounding pink impatience. This kind of marked the edge of the pathway and the edge of the garden. So attractive pots using cannas as a vertical accent and some elephant ears. I did a webinar on growing summer bulbs in containers. It's still available on my website and there's a link to it on the handout. So there's still time if you haven't bought some summer bulbs. I know I've kind of added a few to my order from Longfield. They're on their way, I think soon. So I'm gonna start some indoors, but you could also plant them right in the pot, let them grow, enjoy how they grow. And by the end of the season, they look great and they're blooming. Color echoing is a uh, strategy we use in gardens, but it works in containers to provide unity and balance. So here we have a quarter line with pink and green leaves that echo the pink and green leaves of the coleus and the pink and yellow flowers of that petunia. So it ties that whole planting together by repeating colors in different parts of the plant. 
Here they used a lot of color echoing for the furniture, the red chair, the red gas pump, the red impatience, that rusty red of the coleus. And so that tied this whole setting together. So it anchored it into that setting by repeating the colors of the surroundings in the container. The cotyledon here with that kind of rusty edge really echoes the color of that urn, just making it um, really have a greater impact, subtle but great impact. Not only is color echoing helpful, but texture of the plants we used. So the background plant is Alternathera, um, used to be irisine. There's lots of different varieties out, very fine texture, right? That really contrasts with the bold leaves of the begonia, but they've repeated the colors of that begonia from the leaf of the begonia to the leaves of the Alternathera. And so that ties it together while providing some contrast with the different type of texture. On the left, we have fern, a fern with probably one of the Jurassic type of Rex begonias. On the right, the curly rush with, I think that's Dracula celosia, one of the crested celosias. And so just look at how texture can make the difference in the container and the way the plants show. So here's a really nice combination. So there's Euonymus trained up, uh, it's one of the vining Euonymus trained up a post. And then we've got the Alternathera again with the fine texture, the sedges with fine texture, but a little different growth habit, the bold leaves of the variegated geranium. So just look at how the texture and the colors work on this combination. And Camacyparis, an evergreen um, growing in a pot. So it's all about, it's just green, but the texture really adds a nice element here and is a nice, soft, welcoming addition set next to this chair. So maybe use containers to create a welcome space. Driving into the garage, can't get much better than having these fuchsia, some vinca vine, some nasturtium and geraniums, just a colorful addition to that house. Here, just a variety of planters. Try to imagine these taken away and the difference you feel when you go to that front door. Those plants really guide you to the front door, but really make it warm and welcoming. Here we've got some raised planters. Now, I did some rusty, some uh, screens that you let rust, and the recommendation was do that someplace where the rust won't stain your sidewalk. So if you use any um, rusty type planters read the directions so you end up with the results you want. Juniper's good and hardy. If you're growing trees and shrubs in pots and you're leaving them out year round, if you can pick something that's one zone hardier. So this was in Minneapolis, their zone four. I think they're still zone four in the new USDA. And so ju this juniper is hardy to zone three. Now the coleus and euonymus or elephant ears won't make it, but then they can replenish those annuals each season, but still have those junipers from year to year. I like how they use the black pots to echo the black of the framework and the handle of that door. It just tied that whole entrance together. And then using those um, coleus as a spot of grab your attention color. On the right, um, this is kind of an interesting, the driveway, the walk from the driveway is off camera to the right. And so that takes you to the door and then this leads out to the yard. So those pots kind of anchor the end of that walkway and make you feel like you're walking into that home. Maybe you want to dress up your shed. I think I need to do that. My shed is not this pretty and a few plants probably wouldn't hurt. But how fun is that? Whether it's a she or a he shed that you have, maybe adding some lighting like you see here, some house plants, some annuals, really make it an inviting space. This is at Bouchard Gardens in Victoria, uh, British Columbia. And uh, you may have a pergola on your patio. Look at the difference by adding, there's a vine, um, a wisteria vine climbing up the pole, softens at some hanging baskets, pots. It really anchors the structure, but it also makes it less foreboding. So I think pergolas can be gorgeous, but sometimes a pergola on a hard surface is a little too stark. So adding some plants can really make that a little more warm and welcoming. The same here. So they've got a hard surface, 
in between what you can't see, I think is the garage or this is just an alcove in this building, this home. And by adding those plants, it really softens that whole feeling of this outdoor space. Marking the edge of the patio or deck, um, elephant ears, but look at the purple Persian shield, strobilanthus. That's that kind of pinky purple with green veins, and it will have a silver cast to it. And that Dusty Miller can help pull that silver out. And then the purple stems of that elephant ear echoes the purple of the strobilanthus. Maybe you have some fun plants, agave, and that vertical plant with kind of the funky looking stem is a voodoo lily. And if you've grown voodoo lilies, they produce flowers that just reek. You'll have to bring it inside in cold areas, but kind of a fun vertical accent. Maybe you just have a collection of small pots you want to display better so a plant stand works well. On the right, maybe you've never thought about putting a plant stand in the garden, but make sure it's securely anchored. I don't know about you, but it's pretty windy by my house. And the last thing I want to do is find my plant stand crushing my plants, surrounding plants and all the pots broken. But a great way to add some interest and vertical accent. Same with the window box. Maybe you have a window box next to your patio if you don't have space for containers or you want to increase your plantable space. Hanging baskets, very popular. On the left, this cocoa mat, they cut holes in it so they're growing plants out the side as well as the top of the pot. So don't overlook hanging baskets to hang from an arbor, to hang from your pergola, to hang from a shepherd's crook, just to add eye level screening. And green walls, um, you don't need a huge wall. And here they've used felt type planters mounted onto, I think there's a piece of uh, board behind it to then soften that cement wall to add some greenery where otherwise they couldn't. A pallet turned planter. If you're gonna grow edibles in a, in a pallet, you make into a planter, then use one that's heat treated. Some pallets have some chemical treatment. You don't wanna use those if you're gonna grow edibles in that. And then I just loved to always, this was at uh, San Francisco at the Cow Palace. I spoke there a few years ago and all the, back in the day, it was only men's bathrooms. And so for the women's bathrooms, they put hydrangeas in the urinal. So when you walked in the door, you knew you were in the right place. So, hey, containers have multiple purposes. This is my old um, balcony in the city of Milwaukee. You can kind of see my solar panel, my, um, uh, that's lighting, running those lights that are hanging there. But this was my balcony and the grape ivy on the right hand side blocks the view to my neighbor's second floor bathroom and there's a bougainvillea kind of peeking out. So I used hanging baskets to create a little bit of filtered screening so she wouldn't see in, I didn't see out into her bathroom window. And then the alley, I didn't really wanna look at, but I wanted to see my garden below. So using hanging baskets or containers for screening is a great way to put the screening where you need it without creating a wall. And here's a good example. We saw a different use of these in another part of this home, but defining this space, this patio space, and they have a big yard, but it kind of makes that intimate area and separates it from the rest of the landscape. Maybe you don't have that much room. So it might be a chair with a couple of hanging baskets and containers that screens it from the road or the driveway, but a nice private sitting space. This was in California. I think this was in California and I was lucky enough to visit this garden. I love this. This is Thunbergia, I had to look it up. Um, my Sorensis and I logies you have to it's not available now but you could get on their waiting list I'm not sure where else you would buy it so you might want to check with your favorite garden center but isn't that a cool plant just hanging down there very unique very tropical looking how about screening those utilities, the meters? You don't have a place you can plant plants in the ground. Here they've used a combination of planters to screen some of the utilities behind it. Or maybe it's diverting traffic. You know, people cut across the corner of the garden. Maybe it's a pot, which makes it harder than walking over your bed of annuals. And you can change it out every year. That's elimus. The grass is elimus or lime, L-Y-M-E, grass. Very, very aggressive. So putting it in a pot is a great use of it. 
Tradescantia pallida, sometimes called purple heart plant, um, is that vine that you see, and it echoes the purple of the ornamental cabbage. Maybe repurposing some items like this bathtub. Um, you got to have the right space, but I love the creativity here. So they have a bathtub filled with vegetables and herbs, a couple of nightstands with pots. And so what a nice focal point to fill up the space. How about that leaky bird bath? Maybe grow some golden moneywort in patience um, and set that inside a garden for vertical accent. Or how about an old bird cage on the left? They have a pot of impatience set inside with some cones and moss and stone and thing. On the right, this was one of my planters. This was an old bird feeder and it was kind of running its course. So I was able to shove a pot in there and planted Mercadonia, very small container, heat and drought tolerant. This thing bloomed all summer long. So my challenge was finding a plant that was drought tolerant would fit in a small pot inside of this because I didn't have a lot of room to work, but a fun way to add some interest by repurposing an item. Uh, nothing says herbs like growing them in an old Weber grill that already has drainage holes intact and kind of a fun addition to your patio or deck. You could send your friends out with clippers to uh, pick the herbs they want. Another use of a colander, um, so here I've got a pink gomfrina is the upright plant and pink polka dot plant. Um, I see it kind of come in and out of vogue, but it's got a great foliage grown as a house plant. That's how I first grew it. But now you're seeing it more and more in the garden. Old food cans. Um, this is a primrose planted in an old food can. Just add some drainage holes and potting mix. Um, pots and pans on a steak. So if you're a cook or you have old pots and pans and you don't want to throw them away and they're not good enough to give to goodwill for someone else to use, maybe make them into a planter. I have a few I'm considering doing this for State Fair. On the right, an old garbage can. They dressed it up with some paint and it was a huge container as well. Um, Fountains that maybe you don't want to run water to or you got a deal on. On the left, some pansies with needlepoint English ivy. On the right, this was down in Florida, and I love this with the bromeliads and the Spanish moss. An old fire pit. Um, this is Biden's, B-I-D-E-N-S, very drought tolerant. So picking oranges and reds or yellows that look like flames. So repurposing that into a planter. Um, some ductwork with some succulents, something that doesn't have a major root system, something very different. This was my dad's toolbox. We joke that my dad probably went to he owned every Sears Craftsman tool. I have enough to make all my grandkids a toolbox for when they're grown and have their own house. But I kept one for me. And I'm not sure what some of those tools were, what that bent fork is for, but I filled it with succulents. So it was a way I could dress up the corner of one of my garden beds and think of my dad every time I passed by. Maybe you have some kids toys, like an old um, sand bucket drill some holes in the bottom, add, this is Mexican grass, feather grass, and some petunias. Um, what inspired my toolbox was Jamie's tackle box. She's in northern, northwestern Wisconsin. They live on a lake. And so she combined that whole theme of fishing, an old tackle box planted with some succulents, some lures in addition, just a night, and then on a bait uh, can as well. So fall, we're gonna quickly go through fall. Add some mums, broom corn. Um, never hurts to have your grandkids come and pose for you on their steps. But even just take this mum, that, that pot by the front door and the, the wreath on the door, take those away. It's a beautiful garden, but you can change out the seasonal interest with just a few additions. Here are some fall containers at Pasquazi Home and Garden. So you can buy it ready to go, or you can make your own. This is at Ebert's Greenhouse Village. I love the fact they put some scarecrows next to their huge pots on the left. On the right, that purple leafed plant is black pearl pepper. We've got Jade Princess uh, Penicetum, of course, some mums, some rudbeckia, and some other ornamental peppers. They're edible, but very hot. Um, Swiss chard, cool season plant with golden money wart. Some kale on the right and Swiss chard. 
This was at Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. And what I loved about this, I was up there a few years ago in the fall, they just collected all the material from the landscape and created a container garden with it. And I just thought, well, how cool is that? It really ties it into the surroundings. It's things you have growing in your garden, or maybe you could see they invested in some mini pumpkins and, and uh, decorative corn. I did um, how to grow anything DVD series or instant streaming for great courses. And so we did one of these pots as part of our containers. And we did exactly the same thing, went around, collected some of the materials from the nearby surrounding garden, added a few um, you know, faux berries and put it in a pot and hung it from the fence. Back at Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, their Japanese maple obviously is gonna go in a little protected spot for winter, but adding squash and pumpkins and bales of straw to your plantings, maybe some broom corn, um, will just add that element of fall take that away, make, put some summer containers by there or in the spring. So you could change things out. On the left, uh, my pumpkins with some ornamental peppers, uh, some uh, ornamental millet, a penicetum, rudbeckia, and I had some grass I didn't get planted yet and put it out there. And on the right, just some broom corn as a vertical accent in a container. Carve out your pumpkin and put an ornamental pepper. I use this as a centerpiece during the fall, but you can also do this as a planter with an aster or a mum as well. Ornamental peppers are popular fall container plants, but they are frost sensitive. So you wanna either cover them in the danger of frost or move them inside. Asters and mums and pansies are more frost tolerant. So this makes a great addition, <clears throat> excuse me, outdoors. The croton with mums in a brown pot, doesn't that just scream fall? Pansies and containers along a stairway, take those away. But this is again, you could have pansies in the spring, you could have a summer annual, you could have pansies again in the fall or mums or dress up the steps as they did here. Summer bulbs I mentioned before, dahlias. This is just a pot of dahlias set inside the garden. And then the foliage is nice, but when it blooms, this was in, taken in October in Milwaukee. Boy, it's the star of that garden. And you may find those miniature conifers for sale and wonder what to do. Here I put, put a couple of them in a trough and then I just put them in a very protected spot. This was when I lived in Milwaukee and it was a little milder. Um, you may want to give some added insulation if you're in colder climate to those smaller pots, but it's a great way to add some greenery year round. A dwarf arborvitae mixed with some ornamental peppers for fall. Here it's, um, here it's also in a container. And just some vertical accent texture. Notice what those dwarf conifers can do. They just can add texture and color in a very subtle manner. Don't harm the trees. This is Innis Woods in Ohio. And what I loved is they potted up the hostas, set them in the shade of the tree among the ground covers. So they added some vertical interest, but you're not digging up the tree roots. So plant a perennial ground cover and set pots with either perennials like this. I've had good luck with hostas making it in weatherproof pots year round. Or you can bury a pot and then set a pot inside of it so that you can change it out. So you only dig a hole or a few holes once, then you pot up your annuals and then you set it in that pot. Less disturbance for the tree roots, much easier on your back. Now let's go, we'll finish up with winter. You can buy all these containers ready to go hanging baskets. We often don't think about providing some greenery at eye level. Down below are some magnolia leaves, some twigs, some faux berries. Um, the left, this is my front steps where I live. I had a cascading blue spruce that sprouted, um, sometimes they'll revert, send a branch out, and I kept meaning to prune it off, and I never did. So I finally did, and I decorated the tree, and it's just now losing its needle. So out in the garden for the birds to use as shelter. And then maybe you just have some containers that you shove some spruce tips or trimmings from your landscape. That's what I did here, in, or from your Christmas tree. 
faux berries, or if you have winter berry growing in your landscape and you have fruit, they make great additions to winter containers. Um, on the right are some birch stems and ornaments. Just another um, option. Twigs really, again, can give you some added vertical interest. This is at Ebert's Greenhouse Village. They took grapevines to create kind of an arch um, in there and to give different colors and textures, some ornamental grasses added to their greenery. Um, there's a connection to a link to the video on how to make an evergreen gnome out of a tomato tower and some greens. Uh, so you might wanna do that yourself. And just another example of a winter container on the right. Um, greenery works good with just some indoor outdoor containers and a bow. It doesn't have to be a lot because in winter we're looking for color. I love that they did a candy cane paint job on these twigs that really added a different element, echoed the colors in the bow, and then gave it some vertical interest. Here they've got cones in a basket um, with some baubles. And on the right, they painted these twigs white, put in some red twig dogwood to get that red and white color, and some huge ornaments in a half whiskey barrel. Maybe you're growing hydrangeas. You could paint them or just go natural like they did here. The round balls are balloon flower, a type of milkweed, and they spray painted them gold. And so just a little different natural element along with the pine greenery. On the right, just some uh, hydrangea flowers uh, dried and added to the arrangement. More of those um, milkweed, the balloon flower, milkweed, um, just in some grasses, adding a natural flavor to that winter decor. So just changing it up a bit. And maybe it's nothing but a bunch of colorful twigs in a pot. You know, that can really add some vertical interest and color to the landscape. Most importantly, have some fun. If you are in southeast Wisconsin, the early part of August, stop by the Wisconsin State Fair. You'll find all kinds of inspiration. Jill and her team plant anything that's at least four inches deep. Her feeling is it can make a pot. And this was her collection of shoes. So if they're not good enough to pass on to someone else to wear, might be a way to create some nice pots. Just add some holes and some plants and you're set. As always, please help me grow some gardeners. Um, this was my granddaughter who's now almost 17, but containers were a fun way that I could give her a pot. She could pick out some plants and she can grow them even living in the city and have that chance to be creative. Maybe it's a young family starting their first garden or a retiree. Someone inspired you, please inspired someone else. This webinar is part of our library series sponsored by We Energy. So check out, we've got a link on my website, melindamyers.com. Click on there, you'll find videos, activity sheets. We're adding new information every month. So it's April, May, and June. And things that you can do yourself and with your family. This month's activity was grow a pot of green. So I have a video and an activity sheet to help you along the way. Please join me if you can stand me for another night. Tomorrow night, I'm talking seven step, steps to managing water where it falls in your yard, sponsored by Fresh Coast Guardians. All of these are listed on my website with information about where they are. If you need to register, um, they're all free to attend. Um, please stay in touch. If you've emailed me, I'm trying to catch up on my emails. Please be patient with me. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Again, thanks to We Energy for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks to Kelly and her team for hosting the event and to the public libraries across the state of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan for their participation. Who better to team up with to get information out than our local library? If you are in Wisconsin or the UP, check with your local library. Many have other gardening and green projects and programs, book lists, activities for the whole family, other events. So check out what's happening in your local library. <sighs> I know I went through these really fast. I'm hoping that you can check in with the recording with your handout in hand or on your laptop. I know some people put it on their laptop and watch on their desktop. So thank you all for hanging in there with me. A little bit over an hour, but I'm happy to answer questions, uh, your questions that you may have.
Thank you so much, Melinda. And thank you everyone that tuned in this evening. I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away by um, how diverse the locations are. Let's see, we've got the West Bend Public Library that Ooh. is here with a viewing party. Hi to and our then, friends at West Bend. <laughs> and then we've got the Edgerton Public Library Ooh. as well. And yeah, folks tuning in from all over the state. So, so this has been a wonderful gathering. So let's jump into some questions. So again, if you um, have a question from Melinda, go ahead and drop that in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I'm going to start with Gail's question here. Gail says, I was gifted a large six-tier container garden and would like to plant veggies instead of herbs. What would you recommend uh, that would grow in those pockets? Okay. so. If you want to do vegetables, and depending on how deep it is, so when you're saying a tiered garden, I'm guessing maybe you have pots six inches deep. The good news is there's lots of compact vegetables available now. So Patio Choice Tomato is um, one that grows 18 inches tall, produces up to 100 small yellow cherry tomatoes. Um, in rare seeds, Baker's, Gar Baker's Seeds, and also totally tomatoes. You can find some tomato plants that are growing only like 12 inches tall. And so those are good. Kitchen minis are new from ball horticulture. They're designed really to grow indoors, but you could still grow them outside. And they're designed to grow in a six inch pot. So those would be good. And they produce, there's peppers, there's tomatoes, and there's cucumbers, and they're called kitchen minis. And check out, you'll probably have to order the seeds unless you have a local, check with your local garden center. Greens are great. They don't need, you know, six or eight inch, it's pot works great. I've even started them in little tins with kids. In fact, did a, a project with kids not too long ago where we planted seeds in little in little pots so they each had their own. So you could do that. Um, patio eggplant, you probably want something if you can at least 10 inches deep and you know maybe three in a tier. So I'm not sure how big your tiered is. Kale is a great option. Swiss chard is a great option. Um, so tomatoes, peppers, a lot of our ornamental peppers are edible. A lot of peppers are compact and a lot of them do well in containers um, as well. I'm trying to think of all the things. I've grown lots of vegetables in containers, usually individual pots, you'll have better productivity. Um, but I would say, look for some compact tomatoes, compact peppers. There's a pot opino pepper designed to be in a hanging basket. That would be a great one to use there because it kind of cascades over the edge. Check out All America Selections. There are plants that are tested throughout the US and Canada. They're for working in our backyards and our containers. And they have, if you do containers, it'll pop up all of the plants that are suitable for containers. Some will need bigger pots than you have, but I would start with those. Um, the, art, the artichoke, the imperial star artichoke would be another one, beautiful foliage. So think height on the, the tier, so the taller stuff towards the back, maybe greens towards the bottom, and then maybe the in-between. I'm not sure how that, you know, I'm trying, I might be visualizing something totally different, but experiment and take notes because you may be surprised how much you can do. Small amount of soil, you'll fertilize and water more often. Thank you. So I'm seeing also, um, I want to call them more logistical questions about okay. container gardening. Um, let's see, go back here. Uh, Lori is wondering, so more of a one-on-one -on -one question. Um, I'm new to container gardening. Can you give me some tips? Maybe like, what are some good like starter tips for that? Great question, Lori. I debated. And so thank you for asking. So here are a couple of things. <clears throat> a container with drainage holes. Okay. Cause that way, um, when you water thoroughly, the excess comes out the bottom, you're moistening the soil from top to bottom. So that's great. So, you know, you've watered enough a quality potting mix. Now that's the hard thing. We all are a little bit different. Um, I, I use a brand called Sue, H-S-U. I don't work with them. Um, not that I don't want to, I just, you know, they're not one of my sponsors, but I like it because it's organic. I use their organic mix. It uses rice hulls for drainage, has a lot of leaf compost and some peat moss. And they developed it because they're ginseng growers in central Wisconsin and people, 
saw their compost and wanted it. So they started making it into a potting mix. Not readily available across the country, definitely not across the country, and even limited in the Midwest. Um, the pro mixes, the folks at Ebert's love it. And it uses core, C-O-I-R, which are from the husks of coconuts as the moisture holding instead of peat moss. And then it has perlite, that white kind of looks like styrofoam that adds drainage, or I like vermiculite a little better, less dusty. And that's kind of spongy and more golden brown um, if I don't do the rice hulls. Um, I tried that. For me, it didn't work. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it didn't match the way, I don't know, it didn't work for me. They all love it. So I went back to my soup potting mix. So trying to find one that works for the way you water. I'm pretty good about watering my pots, checking them every day. I have a great neighbor now that will check my pots if I'm out of town. Yay. So I'm very lucky. I also use a product called wool pellets, Wild Valley wool pellets. It's sustainable and organic and it absorbs moisture. And it was developed by a sheep rancher in Utah and he worked with the university to test it. They found the pellets, they pelleted, made it into pellets, that it worked better, mix it into the potting mix. When you plant, you can also add it after the fact, but it's easier. And it reduces watering by up to 20%. So if you're bad at, at watering, it's definitely a good positive. It adds air space, which plants need. And as it breaks down, it adds organic matter. So that's Wild Valley wool pellets. Um, so containers, terracotta pots, heavy. Um, beautiful and classic. They tend to dry out faster because they're porous. They're not weatherproof for those of us in the cold because when ground freezes, ice expands, the pot can crack. The same with a glazed container. Pretty, it's glazed, so it doesn't dry out as fast. It's heavy. So depending on how you're managing your containers, there's a product called a pot lifter that I love, it's a strap with two handles. So if you have big pots and you need to move them in and out or around because you have a party or whatever, um, two people can grab each side, you know, one per handle and it makes it easier. I even use it for those pots that you can't get a good grip even if I'm moving them by myself. That's called a pot lifter. Ups a daisy are false bottoms. You probably talk, hear people go, I have this big pot and I don't want to use all that potting mix. The more potting mix, the more moisture it holds, the less often you have to water and fertilize. So ups a daisy is just a disc. They come in different sizes. They slide down, set down in the pot. So if your pot goes like this, it goes a certain depth. It has drainage holes. So then you just fill that upper portion with potting mix. And so you don't have to fill the whole pot. Um, and that's for those big containers. I know people use cell packs, old water bottles, um, anything to fill the bottom. If you do that, cover it with that black fabric to hold the soil so it doesn't filter down into whatever you use to fill the bottom of the pot. So that's called a false, false bottom. Um, the other thing I'm trying to think, so and then fertilization. So watering is probably the biggest thing. Check them daily, water thoroughly. Self-watering pots extend the time between watering. I like to use, if you know me, I work with malorganite. It's a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. So I do, for me, I put, add that to my containers when I plant, if needed mid season. I'm too lazy to do the mix it up and water it in. So the liquid fertilizers typically are fast high nitrogen quick release. So you mix it up. That's why you do it every week or every other week because what the plants don't use leaches out of the soil. So a slow release fertilizer, you could do once, maybe twice a year, depending on how long you're growing season, how hot and how many plants you put in the pot. So water critical, fertilizer critical. Um, plant numbers in that, there's a link to a blog I did on container gardening. And so when we think about a pot, some people pack their pot full of plants right from the get-go. So it looks beautiful immediately. By the end of the summer, you may have started with five plants, but only three really are showy. The other two are kind of buried because they were overwhelmed by the other three plants. I tend to leave space so that, yes, it's a little bit 
you know, not as full at the start. That's where those twigs come in handy for vertical accent or some of those accoutrements to fill in until my plants fill in. But by the end of the season, if I started with five plants in a 15 inch pot, I'm going to see all five at the end. Um, I know Proven Winners has lots of container examples on their website. I think Ball Horticulture does as well. I'm thinking who else might be. There's so many good examples. I'll say you'll need this many plants per pot, put these together. I work with Birds and Bloom Magazine and they usually feature containers once an issue usually and give you the recipe as well. So um, that might be some helpful things as well, Lori. Thanks, Melinda. I hope that was helpful for, um, for everyone else here too. There's a lot of info, but um, we are recording this just so uh, you know, and then we'll send out the recording link um, usually within a couple of days along with Melinda's handout. So you can watch it again and take more notes. All right, so let's keep going through these questions here. Um, ben uh, says, thank you for hosting this. And actually also we got a lot of thank yous in the chat. So thank you. Uh, when do you think my rose plants will start to show some signs of life again? Oh, you know what, boy, it's, you know, it's a crazy year. And I think everywhere in the country, um, I mentioned the 70 degrees. I remember one day it was 70 in the morning. I woke up and it was 13. You know, it's been hard on our plants. Some things have already sprouted. My roses are just now starting to show. Um, I live out in the country southwest of Milwaukee now and pretty open. Um, even though I'm a five, supposedly, I think I'm now 5B, but I usually go with 5A or 4B plants just because it's so, it's, the temperatures can fluctuate. So um, my daughter lives in the city of Milwaukee, not far from where she grew up. And boy, they're that much further ahead. Um, very, a lot of close homes, her backyard is fenced in, very warm, so they're further ahead. A couple of things with the crazy temperature, even though a lot of you may be a half a zone warmer than you were with the new USDA hardiness map, we did have a lot of fluctuating temperatures. So in the fall, when we go from 40 degrees to below freezing, plants take time to gradually harden off. And so sometimes we can see damage with that fluctuation. So depending on your rose, if it was grafted, um, you're gonna want that new growth coming from the graft. And in the north, we typically plant the graft a couple inches below the soil surface. Down south, they usually put the graft at or slightly above because they're not worrying about the winter killing it. Um, if Burner Botanical Gardens, one year we had a really cold winter and they protected, used to protect their roses with these huge cold frames they'd set out, cover them with uh, carpet in the winter. And one year that was so cold that all their roses, uh, most of them died back to the ground. By the middle of June, they saw signs of growth. So I know the northern part of Wisconsin has had a lot of snow in the UP. So, you know, you guys have had snow, which is a great mulch and insulator, but it also slows the development, which may be okay if we're going to be getting the cold and warm and cold. I wouldn't give up on them. I have seen plants that I thought were dead come back in early June with the crazy weather conditions we've had. So don't I, you know, if you've got a favorite rose and you're worried about not finding a replacement for it, maybe get the replacement just in case. And if the rose doesn't come back, you can pop it in the garden at that point or grow it in a pot and then overwinter it in an unheated garage if you need to for the winter. Long answer, sorry, Ben. <laughs> Hey, our next question is from Denise. Denise wants to know um, when chilling bulbs, um, how long should you do that and at what temperature? Thank you. Great question. And there is a link to a tip on your handout. And the only reason I'm telling you this is if you're like me, okay, that's a lot of information, then you can go listen. Between 35 and 45 degrees, most of them about 15 weeks. Thank you for asking. So that's why a refrigerator, a spare refrigerator works great. But I know not everybody has a spare refrigerator to do that. Um, if you're in the north, taking a pot and sinking it in the ground, the soil around it helps insulate it. The unheated garage, again, depending on where you live, 
Um, for me, I really like that little extra insulation, either setting it on a board or setting it in a styrofoam cooler, just to give it a little bit of extra insulation in case we get really extremely cold temperatures. So 15, uh, about 12 to 15 weeks, 35 to 45 degrees. So great question, thank you for asking. Question from Sue. Um, Sue says, I'm looking for a tropical looking accent plant for full sun. I had cannas last year, so I'd like to try something else. Will, um, oh wait, will be a companion to lantanas. Thank you. So um, banana plants, bananas will take full sun. Um, if you harden off your uh, palms, I see some palms fairly reasonable at garden centers. Um, you know, you'll want to gradually get them used to that full sun, that sago palm. You saw one growing with impatience and shade and one in full sun. I don't know if that's tall enough for what you're looking for. Um, uh, mandavias, there are climbing mandavias. If you visit Suntory, they have a whole series of sun parasol, parasol um Mandavias. Some people still call them diplodenias. They've been moving them around, but there are some that grow three or four feet tall, very tropical, kind of lush, uh, thick leaves that are very glossy. Flowers that remind me of petunias, but very tropical. I find those are one of the few plants that tolerates the hot sun and the wind on my west facing porch. I tried lots of different plants and those really took the heat, took the drought. There's apricot, there's yellow, there's pink, there's red, there's white. Um, so you could get a variety of colors. Those would work very well um, too. So I'm trying to think of what things would be very available for you, but some of those vines um, that then, you know, even a, I don't know if you think of Black Eyed Susan vine as being tropical enough, but I think bananas, I think the New Zealand flax, that formium, I think of um, the mandavia, the vine climbing up, a cup and saucer vine is uh, one that you might be able to find with big leaves that would give you that kind of look. So those would be some that I would check out and then look for some bargains on some house plant kind of things that make you feel like it's tropical. And of course, elephant ears. And there are elephant ears that will take full sun and caladiums that take full sun. So just check the tags when you're buying them. Those are good options too. Got a question from Cassine um, about the bulbs. What, uh, excuse me, what is the latest date that you would plant refrigerated bulbs in containers outdoors? You know, um, the thing is you could do it in June, but they won't last as long because it's so hot. So the cooler, the benefit of getting them out early about the time they would bloom in your garden is the temperatures tend to be cool. Think about spring. When we have a hot spring, your bulbs last a few days. When it's nice and cool, you know, you might have weeks of color and interest. So you can plant them out as late as you want, but think about the temperatures where you're gardening. So you wanna get them out when the temperatures are still sort of cool so you get the biggest benefit of growing those. We've had a couple questions about uh, keeping pests out of containers. Okay. Um, someone mentioned besides like chicken wire, if you have any recommendation for materials, um, and uh, B is asking about the best way to keep squirrels and chipmunks out of containers. Our, our friendly pests. <laughs> I know year. they're yes, exactly. They're cute until they dig up, destroy your container. So a couple things. Um, sometimes what I'll do, and I sometimes have problems with birds nesting and hanging baskets. So sometimes what I'll do is either put netting or better yet, just floating row cover that lightweight fabric that lets air, light, and water through just initially so that I send them somewhere else to go, okay? Especially birds, if they're looking for a place to nest. Chipmunks and squirrels, um, some people have luck with hot pepper, like cayenne pepper. Some find it doesn't work at all. So sprinkling the hottest cayenne pepper you can on the soil surface. I work with plant skid, plant S-K-Y-D-D. -D. It's organic 
Um, it's an organic odor-based repellent. I don't find it, a, you know, you spray it or use the granules in the pot, which is great. Um, I don't find that it's annoying. I use it around my patio and in my containers on my patio. It doesn't bother me. I think I have a pretty good sense of smell. But what I like, it's rain and snow resistant. And it works against chipmunks and squirrels too. Now keep in mind, if there are enough of them, they're hungry enough, there's not a lot. Uh, scare tactics, most urban animals are used to it. So you might wanna check out plant skid, S-K-Y-D-D. -D. Um, you know, sometimes last year I had problems. I was growing garden huckleberries. I put a tomato cage and netting around just to try to keep the ground squirrels. Um, plant skid doesn't always work on ground squirrels because they are omnivores. They eat a wide variety of things. And I, once the plants got established, I was able to take that off. I just had to initially protect them so the ground squirrels found somewhere else. But the plant skid, I've had good success with chipmunks, squirrels, rabbits, deer. Um, those are kind of my main pests that I'm dealing with. But yes, they're very in, cute, but annoying. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions about um, the size of containers. Um, so one person would like to know, like, what is an ideal um, height for a container to use? And then if you happen to have a large pot, what are some options to help fill them just besides all soiled? Okay, so with size, a lot of it depends on what you're growing. So I showed some tall, narrow pots, but they also had tall plants in them. Though I have seen people just use trailing plants over cascading down. And so that old thriller filler spiller design technique, if you're feeling intimidated by designing, the thriller is the upright plant. And so I, I started my career doing some work at a florist. And so florist, back then especially, you know, the idea was your pot was a third of the total arrangement. That's kind of a good way to think about how big is your plant going to mature to make sure that pot is in scale with it. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be taller. I showed you that one with the obelisk with the morning glory and that obelisk was probably five feet tall and the pot was probably only two feet tall. So yeah, it was a little more than two thirds of the overall size. So um, you wanna make sure if it's a tall, narrow pot that it, it you wanna put enough soil in there to hold it in place. Some people even put stones in the bottom. That doesn't help with drainage, more for weight if you're worried about the wind blowing over something that's really tall. Um, so size depends a lot on what you're growing. So tomatoes, for example, an indeterminate tomato, a five gallon pot works great. So like an old five gallon bucket, drill some holes, put it in the back behind your pretty pots. Um, a compact determinate, one that grows a smaller size only needs about a three gallon size pot. Peppers, about a three gallon size pot. Um, if you go to Proven Winners, they do have some, and on my hand, on my blog, I give you some guidance on if you're doing a 15 inch diameter pot, you probably can do three, maybe four plants in there if you want to pack them in. When you go to 18 or 20, probably five plants. Now we know you'll, you've seen more plants than that put into a container. I know I've done that myself. Just keeping in mind that you're going to have to water and fertilize more because there's limited soil, more plants. So um, I've done six inch pots, put herbs in six inch pots. I had to water several times a day. I won't do that again. I usually like to do at least a minimum of a 10 inch deep and a eight to 10 inch in diameter, just because the more soil, the more moisture it holds, the more nutrients it holds. So I, I, it's a little more forgiving. Um, I talked about the false bottom. So putting, um, using an upside daisy, which is a disc or a square that is made to fit and nestle in towards the bottom of the pot, that creates a vacant spot below. So you use less potting mix. Um, putting cans, cell packs, some people use packing peanuts, not the biodegradable ones because they will biodegrade and stain your, um, stain the, the um, patio or deck. Um, and then put something, a fabric over top that lets water through. So when you water, it runs through and out the drainage holes, but so that um, you, you use less soil. The other thing is, 
if you have a pot that doesn't have drainage holes and you don't want to drill holes in it, you can do what's called double potting. Grow your plant in a nursery pot. Most garden centers have racks of them. They give away, if you know gardeners, I have racks of pots. I'm always happy to give away. Um, and I use them, I'll plant up, say I'm growing um, my, uh, I have a raspberry shortcake, a compact raspberry I grow in a decorative pot, but I plant it in one of these nursery pots, set it in my pretty container for the growing season. In fall, I lift it out overwinter it in my unheated garage, or I can bury that in a vacant part of the garden. So it's lighter weight, easier to move. And if that pot fills up with water, I just lift my pot out and dump the excess water, or I elevate the container in it. So as the water fills, it's elevated above. Eventually I need to empty that, but it gives me a little bit of breathing space. So hopefully that helps. Keep in mind the more potting mix, yes, it's expensive, but the less often you water too, the more forgiving. All right, and then related to that question, uh, Lori would like to know, would you recommend putting stones in the bottom of containers? I'm glad you asked that. Um, when you put stones, they don't provide drainage. So I'm glad you asked that question, Lori. That was an old, and you'll still see it recommended. And when I was teaching, I told my students, trust me on this because it's about soil science. But when we put stones in the bottom, two things happen. It shortens the, the column for the water to go down. So it is negative impact on drainage, not a positive. Plus, if you don't have drainage holes and you put stone in there, what happens? You water thoroughly, little bit extra down there, then a little bit extra. And pretty soon it ends up getting to the soil level and then your soil stays wet, you get soggy soil and your plants die. The only time I recommend stones, it's with you have a pot with drainage holes, but you're worried about a big plant toppling over in the wind because it acts like a sail. And so I've sometimes put some big rocks in the bottom because I was worried that my pot wasn't heavy enough without them and it would fall over in the wind. Um, but otherwise there's no need to put rocks in the bottom. Some people put a piece of terracotta pot over the drainage hole to keep the soil from filtering out. I use coffee filters. I cover my drainage holes fill it with potting mix. So until the plants have a chance to fill that pot with roots, the soil, the potting mix doesn't go out the drainage hole. So that's one way to reduce soil loss, potting uh, mix loss through those drainage holes. And since you mentioned um, strong winds, uh, John is asking about, um, well, one question, how to prevent tomatoes from drying out fast, but also preventing the pot from falling over with strong winds. Right. And so again, um, doing the rocks or sometimes what I'll do is I'll surround them with small, shorter pots that are heavy. Maybe um, have some of my other plants in glazed pots that I'm either sticking my container in so that they have a little bit of weight to them, trying to position accordingly um, because I, I don't know, I, I feel like the wind just whirls around my house. And so, I, but I do have some spots that are a little more protected where I put my taller plants um, out of the, the harsh wind, but still getting enough sunlight. So again, using a larger container, um, that helps because the weight of the potting mix and the container as well will help keep it upright. Cannas can be an issue too, because they act like sails. If you don't have a pot that's heavy enough to hold them in place and they're out in a windy situation. So to, to extend the time between watering, we often don't think about mulching, right? So when you put your plants in, add a few evergreen needles or shredded leaves to help conserve moisture until the plants fill in and cover that pot. So that will help reduce watering. Um, water thoroughly to train the plants to grow deep roots that fill that container. That's gonna extend the time between watering. I like self-watering pots um, for busy people. They have a reservoir at the bottom. Now, some people have told me they've had problems with them staying too wet, but I think I tend to underwater, so I haven't had that problem. But you fill that reservoir with water and then the water's absorbed through capillary action. So when the soil's dry. The other thing is there's a thing called a plant nanny and it's a terracotta spikes hollow. Dig a hole in the pot, set it in there, empty a wine bottle, however you choose, fill it with water, turn it upside down. 
water moves from high concentrations to low concentrations. So if the, when the soil's dry, the water moves through that terracotta spike and moistens the soil. Test it before you leave town. But I had one woman tell me she, that was the only thing that allowed her to contain her garden in Arizona. She moved back to Wisconsin, but she said hot, hot and dry. And she used those and they worked great. Plant Nanny. And they also have one that's adapted to a two- uh, two liter soda bottle that screws into the top. But I think it can be pretty. And a couple of those in the pot with maybe a blue wine bottle, even a green one might add a little color to your container and extend the time between watering. And those glass globes that I thought were just a scam, uh, Jeff Gilman wrote a book about uh, gardening myths and he tested them and found that they really did help extend the time between watering. And some people just take a wine bottle or a pretty bottle and just stick it in the soil, fill it with water as needed and put it, punch a hole and then put it in that pot upside down and they found that works as well too. So those are just some ways to kind of extend that time. Still check them and if you're leaving town, test before you leave town for several days and expect it to work. And then there are irrigation uh, systems designed especially for containers. Got a couple uh, questions here about uh, so those potted citrus plants. Yeah. Um, yeah. How warm should you have your house um, if you want to keep them indoors over the winter? You know, just normal temperatures are fine because they can take it cool. They just can't take frost. So actually, when we were trying to keep plants, um, when the first energy crisis, I remember in the 70s happened, I got lots of calls. Are my plants going to die? I'm turning my heat down. They actually did better. Cooler temperatures, higher humidity, less heat on, and they did fine. So if you're keeping your house comfortable for you, it will be fine. Just avoid those drafts. So they like lots of sun but you may need to set them back from your patio door, back from a window. I find I have a few west, uh, west windows that it gets pretty cold when the wind's blowing and I just move my plants back a couple of feet as needed uh, so they get that light. And then artificial lights, the LED lights have come down in price. Um, winters can be short days, many gray days. So supplementing with artificial light can really increase your success. So if you're comfortable, your plants will be comfortable. Good question. Thank you. So yeah, speaking of light, we've got some questions about that. Uh, ben is wondering, uh, what are some recommendations you have for really severe Western light for a balcony garden? And then John would like to know what are good shade plants and flowers um, for containers on a deck? Great. I can see we could do a whole series on containers. And I, so I, let me start with, let's start with full sun. I mentioned the Mandavia because I have a west facing porch, lots of wind and really brutal sunlight. So mandavias did very well for me. And as I mentioned, you can grow them as a hanging basket. You could train them up a trellis depending on the ones you get. Tomatoes will take full sun. You will need to water. I think it was you, Ben, maybe that asked about how you don't have to water so often. Um, tomatoes and peppers, if you think about them, they grow well in full sun. Zinnias, they're kind of the hot trendy plant right now and you can get them anywhere from the profusions that are about oh maybe 10 12 inches tall uh, great pollinator plants great heat and drought tolerance portulaca or moss rose now they tend to close up when the light gets dim so not the best one if you're sitting on your balcony just at night but those do very well in hot dry conditions uh, Biden's, B-I-D-E-N-S, has got some good heat and drought tolerance. Um, so Celosia coxcomb, you can get them anywhere from six inches, the crested form, even tall crested form to the plume. They look like little wheat kind of flowers to the plume types. They take it hot and dry and do great. Salvias, most annual salvias will do well in hot, dry conditions. So moss rose, Bidens, kind of low growers, um, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, even cucumbers if you want something trailing or train it up a post. Um, zinnias, all different sizes. Marigolds, African marigolds, more so than French marigolds, will take it hot and dry. Cosmos will take it hot and dry, and you can get sonatas that are like 15 inches tall. Um, 
So those are Cosmos will do very well. So those are some that you might want to give a try. Um, and that Mezu, M-E-Z-O-O, -O, I think I'm spelling it right. Um, I tried it on my West Deck. It didn't work well for me, but I know others who've had good luck with it in hot, dry conditions as well. And even your succulents, you might try if you like the look of those. On the other hand, for shady plants, um, this is where a lot of our tropicals do well. So many caladiums with the colorful leaves and elephant ears do great in shade. Um, impatience, the bounce impatient, the um, the bounce impatient is resistant to downy mildew. Um, beacon impatience, there's a series of them. Those are resistant to downy mildew. That was the disease that took out um, impatience. Sun patients will grow in sun. We've seen those in full sun at State Fair on our pillars, but also take some shade as well as New Guinea impatience, sun and shade. Um, coral bells. There are many coral bells. It's a perennial, but you could use it in a container as well. Um, so we've got some ferns uh, that you might bring a tropical fern. Your Rex begonias do very well in partial shade. Browalia, B-R-O-W-A-L-L-I-A, -L -L -A, comes in a beautiful blue. That does well in shade. Terenia, which wishbone flower does well in shade. Kind of reminds me of pansy, but it takes the heat much better. Um, you can also do, let's see, we talked about begonias. Um, that dragon wing begonia I showed you will take full sun to shade. Might even want to try it in that west face location. I forgot to mention lantana, hot, dry. That's for Ben for those hot, dry, west facing places. Um, so impatience, shade coleus, some coleus are some, some are shade. Um, hot cone grass and sedges will also take some shade. So uh, those are a few to get you started. All right, so we talked about some protections from critters. Um, Wendy would like to know, how do I keep the Japanese beetles and grubs out of my vegetable garden? Oh, Japanese beetles. Okay. Um, last year for me was not a bad year. A lot of us were lucky and, and they tend to go and peak. They'll peak and then the population falls. They're never going to be gone. So a couple of things. If you catch them early, the University of Minnesota found, you know, when those first few arrive, if you can pick them off, throw them in soapy water, um, the plant, the injury they cause to the plant gives off a chemical that attracts more Japanese beetles. So if you manage the early visitors, you can reduce the number that follow up. There are um, pesticides that you can use, always read and follow label directions. Most of us are looking to support pollinators and don't wanna use it. There is a product called Beetle Juice, J-U-S, or Beetle Gone, G-O-N-E, that is an organic. It's a type of Bacillus thuringiensis. It's the strain Galleria that works on grubs and Japanese, be the adults and grub stage of certain beetles, including Japanese beetles. Um, if you treat your lawn, so the Japanese beetles feed on like 300 different types of plants, lay their eggs typically in grassy areas, but also in gardens. And then those grubs feed on the roots of grass plants and other plants, go deeper in the winter, come back up in spring, feed on the plant roots, they pupate, turn into adults that feed on plants. The adults can fly two miles, up to two miles. So even if you treated your lawn, your neighbor's Japanese beetles might come and feed on your plants. Don't use traps, it brings them in. If your neighbor offers to give you a trap, don't take it because they're trying to get the Japanese beetles in your yard instead of theirs. But if you're looking for an organic option, check out Beetle Juice. You'll probably have to order it online or Beetle Gone. I know, I think Gurney's bought out Gardens Alive and that's where I think I bought mine. Um, but you know, do an online search and you'll probably find it. I had a couple gardeners tell me they had 90% success. I think that's not bad for using a very specific product. So you don't hurt the bees, you don't hurt the beneficial insects, um, like the praying mantids and things. So maybe try some of those things. All right, so we just have time for a couple more questions here. Um, good question from John. Uh, John is wondering, is there such a thing as putting too many plants in a pot? And should you leave <laughs> lots of room? Good question. That is always the danger, isn't it? 
So uh, how I shop for my plants is I grab the cart. So if you ever see me at Ebert's or Pasquazi shopping, feel free to stop me and save me from myself. So I pick out my thriller, you know, something new, something different, something I love, a traditional favorite. Then I go look for something that maybe will complement it, either as a filler and spiller, depending on the look I'm going for. Yes, you can put put too many plants in a pot. It doesn't mean you won't be successful. It just means more work for you. So for example, Ebert's does these huge, great, beautiful hanging baskets packed full of plants. And they recommend doing weekly fertilization. And the reason is there are a lot of plants in this pot and they'll keep looking great with a little bit of trimming and regular fertilization. So you can keep a lot of plants alive in a, a pot, but you're gonna have to water more often and fertilize more often. So again, the guideline that's in that blog I did for Melorganite kind of gives you a variety of plant sizes. So you're not gonna give a plant say, if you were gonna grow basil in your garden, you would probably space them 15 inches apart. In a pot, that might be one plant. And if I've got a 10 inch pot, I'd probably put basil, maybe a um, maybe an ornamental pepper, and then maybe a third pot. I have put my, you saw one of those pots where I had my basil, my purple basil, my compact tomato and I forget all in a nasturtium. And that was probably in a 10 or 12 inch diameter pot. And that was three plants. So I kind of spaced them out and figured out how big they're going to grow, how close together. I don't know if this is helping you. It's kind of one of those, you know, oops, that was too many. So one of them may be overtaken by the other. I may opt to prune a little bit harder or I just make a note, don't do this next year. So hopefully that helps. The other thing I wanted to mention, if you want tomatoes and you want your maximum harvest, put one tomato in a pot by itself because you'll get the most productivity. Same with peppers and eggplants. I like to mix things up. I like to put some flowers, herbs, and vegetables together. I think it looks good. Um, when I lived in the city, I didn't have room. So I wanted to be able to grow a little bit of everything. So I really put them in there. I had space, I have space when I plant, you know, a few inches between the plants. Try to envision how big that plant's going to get. In a pot, that'll help stunt it a bit. And then think about the height of that plant compared to the height of your container. Will it look out of balance, like it's going to topple over? Will it be overwhelmed by the pot? Which, you know, some pots, they're the star. Sometimes it's the plant. Um, my friend Jerry, who's a great container gardener, often uses nursery pots because he has these really cool plants and he doesn't want the pot to take away from them. So he'll pot these, make these great arrangements in the container. And then the pot is just there as a backdrop and doesn't steal from the show. So I'm not sure I helped you. So check out my container blog because that gives you different sizes and number of plants that might be helpful. But usually with a 10 inch pot, three plants, 12 inch, you might be able to get four, 15, you could probably get five, one in the middle and a couple around the edges um, that work quite well. And try that and see if that works for you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone that has stuck around. Yes. Um, just as a <laughs> reminder, you. just as a reminder, um, we will be sending out the recording to this presentation along with Melinda's handout um, and links to upcoming programs. Um, we have a, a really nice thank you in the chat from Nancy at West Bend. Uh, she says West Bend's party is calling it a night and see you next round. Um, so why don't we tackle the last question here from Lynn. Is it too early to start cannas and pots outside? If you're in Wisconsin, yes. So what I do is I start mine in one gallon pots that I save from perennials I bought. You could also pick those up at the garden center. I start mine inside to get a jump start on the season. And I, I grow, I have a my spare bathroom is one of the warmest rooms in my house. I put artificial lights once they start sprouting, but I have shelves in there that is nice and warm to get them growing. Then they can either move into the winter window. Last year, I started my dahlias in the garden, um, but what I did is I prepped the soil, used clear plastic to warm it, 
then put the, you want the temperatures to be around 60 degrees, the soil temperature. So a soil thermometer is important. Then I used row cover to keep them warm because we get some pretty chilly nights, even in May and June. And that got them jump started. So you want your soil, you could pot them in a pot, put it out on the warm days, bring it in when it's cold. And that's another way to jump start the season. So we talked a little bit about this growing summer bulbs like cannas, dahlias, glads in containers. And that webinar is on my website, melindamyers.com. So you might want to check that out as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, and again, we'll be sending out the link to this recording um, probably in a couple of days along with the handout. Um, please, uh, if you are free tomorrow night, feel free to register for um, getting the title here, Seven Steps to Managing <laughs> Water Where It Falls in Your Yard um, with Melinda and Fresh Coast Guardians. So we're going to be back here tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Um, Central Time. Um, so we just appreciate all of you. Yes, Thanks thank for coming you. out and spending your evening with us. Thank you, Melinda, so much. This is such a helpful presentation. So I know I'm going to be going over all of this again as we start getting our, our garden areas ready for the season. So um, a lot to digest and um, a lot to look forward to this season. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And then um, everyone check out mpl.org for more great programs coming up in our YouTube channel. We've got um, so many awesome webinars with Melinda uh, recorded there. So you can go back and watch those at your leisure. Um, and they all have the links to handouts in the description. So thank you, Melinda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. And thanks to all of you who joined us this evening. Have a great growing season and hope to see you in person or at another webinar. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night.